So hello and welcome back to Christine tries something new out in the woods and hopes desperately that it's going to work and that also the wind stops being so windy. <laughs> I figured we would go back to our roots and at least while the weather is beautiful I could try to do the first like major chapter review out here in the woods for the wonderful book, The Phoenix Unchained. But I do realize that since I had to pull everything down, for anybody that's jumping right in, I better do like the incomparable Inigo from The Princess Bride. And let me explain, or better yet, let me sum up. Now, this is the first book of the Enduring Flame Trilogy by Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory, a wonderful writing duo who have now written two trilogies and I don't know if it's just one or two in what might be the final trilogy of these. I've got the, the first one of the final potential trilogy that they wrote but I couldn't get into it as much. I might have to give it another try, but let me just sum up where we are before I get into an explanation of the events in chapter 10, which is where we're gonna pick up and try and do like an in-depth uh, chapter review of that one. So in this book, in chapter one, we're basically just meeting our main characters. We're meeting Harrier Gillian, he is the son of the portmaster, or the dockmaster, in Armethale. Look at me, I can finally say that word. I'm kind of proud of myself. Um, it is the main capital city in this world, and if you were around for the first trilogy, which I'll have to try and like sum up at some later point, uh, you know that it is the mage city, and it was, in the first trilogy, the city of mages. It thought itself invulnerable, it kind of walled itself off from the rest of the world, and there goes the wind again. Hmm. This may have been a mistake. We'll have to wait and see. I'm going to be really mad if I have to re-record this. Not terribly mad, though. But anyway, we meet Harrier Gillian. He is the son of the portmaster, so a very important person, Harrier's father is. And we learn that Harrier was something of a surprise baby. The Gillians, we learn, have always had three sons. I don't know how they managed to do that, but it's always a son for the sea a son for the land, and a son to be portmaster after the father passes on. Harrier was actually the fourth child. He's the youngest of the Gillians, and things got rearranged when he came along, but he is about to graduate from normal school and become the apprentice portmaster. It's something he's not thrilled about, but he is willing to do his duty. Now we also meet his best friend, Tercel Rolfair, who is a son of the minor nobility, and he and Harrier have been best friends since, I think it's said that Tercel was either three or four, and Harrier is a year older than Tercel. They met because Tercel has boundless curiosity, always has, probably always will, and he almost fell off the docks in the city. Harrier rescued him, and they've been best friends ever since. Now, to hear Harrier tell it, he is always pulling Tercel out of trouble, which Tercel does admit is the case sometimes, but he also helps Harrier out a lot. Harrier is very slow to make up his mind, and even slower to change his mind. Put a pin in that, that becomes a defining characteristic of Harrier. Now, Harrier is having his 16th naming day, or it could be his 17th. I should have actually written that down, but it's, it's his birthday. 
and in the city it's also the flower festival which is a grand festival celebrating the sacrifice of the blessed saint Idalia who died defeating the demon queen in the last trilogy and brought back the world to life hence the fact that we are out in the middle of a beautiful woods right now and we know as readers who hopefully have read the first trilogy that that's not exactly how things went down but we also learn that it has been exactly 1008 years since the events of the last trilogy so myth has become legend and things have sort of switched around but our best friends they go to the flower festival we learn there that Tercel has a decided interest in history, specifically ancient history, because he's a very studious young man, and that they are going to reconvene back at Harrier's house for Harrier's birthday party, and that is where the chapter ends. In the second chapter, Harrier's uncle, who has been across the sea for a very long time, shows up. He gives Harrier a birthday present of a book. This is not Harrier's, like, favorite thing. He would have rather had a model ship. Harrier really likes things that he can touch. Unlike the wind that I can't touch and make stop. Fingers crossed that you guys can actually hear me. I would put some sort of a baffle over wherever the microphone is, but I don't know where the microphone is on this uh, phone of mine. Anyway, so Harrier gets a book. He's not all that thrilled about it, but Tercel's very interested in this book. And he tells Harrier that he will take it home and read it. This makes Harrier at least mostly pleased. And we go on to the next chapter where Tercel has been reading the book and discovers that ancient times so long ago, the book is very old and it tells him all about a time when there was not just wild magic in the land, but another magic that anybody could learn. And he's really, really interested in this because he never has heard of the high magic. He's only heard of wild magic, and wild mages are around in the world still, but they are as rare as elves, so very rare indeed. We also learn that the elves from the first trilogy have all withdrawn east, leaving the lands in the west to humans, and centaurs, and the occasional fawn. But pretty much all of the other folk have left with the elves. Well, not too long after that, Harrier shows up telling Tercel that there is a ship in port and the captain of that ship is claiming that he was attacked by a kraken. Which would be really weird because everybody knows that there aren't any krakens anymore. They were all vanquished by Kellen the poor orphan boy and the blessed Saint Adalia, hearkening back to characters from the first trilogy. So Tercel and Harrier go and they check it out and Tercel thinks this isn't really fair. He asks Harrier what's going to happen to the captain if it's proven that it's not a kraken and Harrier lets him know that the captain will probably lose his ship. Tercel has a very strong sense of justice and he decides since he's been reading all about this high magic that he's just going to try a little spell. Because on top of just reading Harrier's book, he's also been researching in the closed files of the city and has decided that he's going to be a scholar of ancient history when he goes to university. So he sets everything up, kind of fudging a few of the details. I mean, how important could all of those candles be? And who cares if it's not done at the right time of day or with the right prayers and fasting? It'll be fine. Magic is easy. So he sets everything up. He performs the incantation and he passes out. Well, he's passed out. 
he has a dream and in that dream we move into another chapter where we meet Bisochim. Bisochim is a wild mage born in the Mandirian Desert which is far, far, far to the south of Armethale. In the desert the land is harsh, there's not much time to be a child, and Bisochim is a child when we first see him, and he's out trying to tame himself a fledgling hawk so that he can become a master hunter for his tribe. He climbs up, reaches into the nest, and he finds the three books of wild magic, which basically just makes him instantly a wild mage. He becomes one of the greatest wild mages in all of the desert. Now, unlike in the northern lands, in the desert, wild mages are delineated and well known. They wear a very specific blue robe to let everyone know that they're wild mages because the Isvani, which are the desert people, kind of depend on their wild mages, and Bisochim is the greatest of the wild mages, but from the time he first got his three books, he always has thought that there was something wrong with the wild magic and the balance of the world. We don't know why he's always thought that, but from the minute he got his books, that was his thought. So he goes off, mostly by himself, into the desert to meditate on this and just think he does. He loves his people, but he likes to be alone. So Bisochim heads off, and one day while he's out hunting, his hawk and his dogs come back to him afraid of something, and he comes around the corner, and he discovers Saravase. Saravase is a beautiful red dragon who managed to get caught in a sand wind, exactly what it sounds like, uh, basically a sand tornado, sounds terrible, I don't want to do that, and she is tangled in a bunch of thorn trees, she tries to tell him to leave, that she doesn't need his help, but he helps her anyway. She follows him back to his stronghold that he has made in the desert, and after a few days, she lets him know that he is the one that she is meant to bond with. Now, elves normally bond with dragons because when a dragon bonds with a mage, it gives that mage infinite fuel to power the mage's spells, because a dragon is a creature of magic, but can't perform magic. A mage is someone who can perform magic, but doesn't really have enough power to do big spells without asking permission and sharing the price of those spells. After some back and forth, Saravase and Bisochim bond, and now Bisochim is definitely the greatest of all of the wild mages of the Isvani Desert. He also is now even more convinced that there is something wrong with the great balance of life, and what he decides is wrong is that there is too much light in the world that back when the blessed Saint Adalia died, that let too much light into the world because she completely vanquished darkness, and what he needed to do is just let a little bit of darkness back in, and then everything would be in balance again. Now we can see he's starting to tread down a very slippery slope, because he starts being contacted by voices in a lake of fire, which is what Tercel has been dreaming about, is this lake of fire. And the voices tell him that, yes, they, they, they will help him bring darkness back into the world. Now, he thinks it's going to be in a form that he can contain, but they tempt him with the same thing that always tempted wild mages back in 
ancient times over to the side of darkness, and that is the fact that the price of bonding a dragon for the dragon, for the whole pair, but mostly for the dragon, is that when their mage dies, they also die. A dragon is immortal until they bond, and then their lifespan matches that of their bonded. So, being tempted by darkness, Viso Chim be begins researching how to let darkness back in. He finally figures it out. He tells Saravase she is not happy with him. She would rather die at the end of like 40 years than let darkness back in. But Viso Chim is like, ah, you know what? Once I let darkness back into the world, everything will be fine. I'll have forever to get her to forgive me. So he moves on and he's going to do it. Now, Tercel doesn't know all of this. He's been having nightmares ever since he did that magic spell about a lake of fire. In fact, it was so bad that we find out he inadvertently did a magic spell and that's what wakes him up from this nightmare of the lake of fire and this admittedly beautiful naked woman standing in the middle of the lake just beckoning which terrifies him wakes him up and um turns out tercel has the mage gift and he sets his room on fire not the best way to find out you have magic but i guess it'll do so he finds out that he has magic. Later on, he finds out after constantly being sick all the time that uh, he got a few things wrong with his magic spell. Actually, he got a lot of things wrong. He also finds out that he has to find someone to train him or take away the mage gift from him or he's going to die. After a lot of fighting with Harrier, the boys finally talk, and because they have been best friends forever, Harrier and Tercel convince their parents that they are going to go on a short little trip up to another one of the cities named Centaur Shadin. They are hoping to find a wild mage to cure Harry or to cure Tercel of this little magic problem, and then they can go back and start their lives with Harrier becoming harbor master one day. Enter cell heading into college. The trip does not go as planned. They do run into a troop of fawns in the road that amuse me greatly. Um, fawns remind me a lot of my raccoons that come and visit my house every night. I feel like a troop of fawns and the raccoons on my porch have a lot in common. But they move up the road, they have a few run-ins with raccoons, they have a run-in with bandits, and are saved by a centauress named Samara. Samara helps them out, and they kind of team up with her and head to an inn where they're going to spend the night. This is all in the plans, and keep on moving the centaur Shadin. They do not tell Samara, even though she did help them out, about why they're going to Centaur Shadin, but you know, they, she at least helped them. So they sleep at the inn that night, and that night is when Bisochim sends a killing cold at the Champion of Light, who we find out is Tercel, who he feels is a threat to him. He sends Cold to the inn, and it almost kills our intrepid heroes and everyone at the inn. It does actually kill some of the chickens and a couple of the stable animals that freeze to death. Tercel manages to wake up and promptly set the inn on fire, which, despite the fact that he sets the inn on fire using magic, it does wake everybody up and kind of saves everyone's lives. But after that, Tricel and Harrier tell Samara what they're really up to, that they are hoping to find a wild mage, 
She agrees to guide them because they don't want to stay anywhere around people where bad wind, where potentially it could um, cause issues like everyone freezing to death. And they head off to Centaur Sh or yeah, to Centaur Shadeen, hoping to find a wild mage. Unfortunately, they don't. When they get to Centaur Shadeen, they do find the preceptor of the Temple of the Light, Megalwyn, who tells Tercel that after Tercel confesses everything to him, he tells Tercel, I haven't seen a wild mage around here in forever. You just sleep here in the Temple of the Light and, you know, I think you need to just keep heading until you find a wild mage. Maybe go see the elves. Tercel's like, see the elves? But that that's what the advice is. So the boys head on. We find out as the boys leave the city that Megalwyn is actually also a wild mage and he did not reveal that, but he did at least hope that Tercel is going to be okay. The boys had keep on keeping on. They're heading east, trying to find a wild mage, hoping that one comes across them. Samara, the centauress, is traveling with them because she wants to see how the story is going to end. And they have a lot of bickering, fighting, and they meet a bear. But it's not really just a bear. It is a bear that is as red as, I was going to say blood, but blood isn't really all that red, is as red as the band on this bottle of water. And this bear is also huge. It's also not really a bear. It's obviously some sort of a magical creature. And that oak tree just dropped an acorn and almost hit me in the head. Rude tree. Anyway, they meet this bear. Tercel performs a new magic. I was going to say magic trick, but a new magic spell. He makes a ball of light appear. It scares off the bear. They move on. And they decide that it's about time for Tercel to start practicing this magic. Now, he did copy most of the magical spells that he had learned back in the library into his own little workbook. He makes himself a magic wand, again just kind of guessing at things, and begins practicing magic. But he doesn't let Harrier or Samara know that every time he does more than a few little magic spells, he gets very weak and very sick. And, you know, he's just going to keep that to himself, but they just keep on keeping on. And after a little while, they decide that maybe, maybe Tercel should try to summon help. Because obviously there are no wild mages out here in the middle of nowhere. Harrier says that, you know, they could be traveling for the rest of their lives and never see a wild mage. So they agree to try. Samara advises that they try this summoning spell in the middle of a mostly dry riverbed, just in case Tercel sets everything on fire. Tercel does his little spell. It definitely doesn't work because he passes out. When he wakes up, uh, he wakes up basically because everyone carries him back to the fire where they find a wild mage waiting for them. This is the wild mage, Ronidia, who lets them know that she can't really help them. She definitely thinks that they should go see the elves. She gives them each a magical talisman. She gives Samaria some arrows. She gives them each a nice big knife. And she gives Harrier a sword and then tells them all that they should eat dinner and go to bed. She also does a lot of thwacking Harrier with her spoon. That seems to be her defining characteristic, and I love her for it. When they wake up, she has disappeared. The boys are a little bit miffed about that, but 
She has told them that they should probably get some more supplies at a little town called Windy Meadows that isn't too far away. And they can't find hide nor hair of the mage Ronidia, who it turns out has a Tarnkapa for both her and her donkey. A Tarnkapa is a bespelled piece of cloth that goes over you and makes you completely undetectable, unseeable, unsmellable, unhearable, and so she poofs off her on her magic, merry way, magic way. And the boys in Samara, after searching for her for a while, finally give up and travel towards the town of Windy Meadows. Now, the town of Windy Meadows is the first time we really see that darkness really is coming back into the world. Maybe Biso Chim hasn't done a great job of letting darkness in or out. We don't know what he's been doing, but something is up at Windy Meadows. They show up in the middle of, well, almost evening, and there's no one in town. They go into the inn, they investigate at the inn, and they find the taps are open, the floor is damp, there's still food in the bowls at the inn, but there's no people anywhere. And when they head out, they run into creatures. These creatures are described as being about the size of a four or five year old child gray skin, bulging eyes, mouths filled with pointy teeth, really long arms, and creepy. I would say creepy. So the boys see only two at first, and they, they try to back away. They get on their horses, and every time they turn to look, there are more of them. So they're about to run and the horses, our, our dear horses that the boys bought, are definitely ready to run. Tercel's horse gets the bit into his, into, between his teeth and takes off with Tercel, leaving Samara and Harrier behind. And this is where we get our first major character death, which I do remember the first time I read through this series, I was like, She's on the cover. She's on the cover. We can't lose a major named character, but one thing I do love about Mercedes Lackey and James Mallory, they are not afraid to kill off a character that's on the front of the book because it turns out what they're facing is goblins. Goblins have the ability to spit poison and they are all eternally hungry they devour the boys' pack pony thunder, and while they're fighting everything off, they manage to bite Samara, and she dies. The only good bright note is that Tercel comes back. He manages to get his horse back under control, gets it turned, gets back to where Samara is now down in the road, passing away and he lights the goblins on fire. This affects him deeply because he is a gently bred city boy who's never really had to look at or think about death. But he lights those creatures on fire and they try to treat Samara. It doesn't work. She dies and they dispose of her body in the centaur way, which is laying her out on clean grass to let nature take care of, and the boys go on because they can't stop. They were told to find the elves, but now they are down to whatever was in the saddlebags of their horses because they have absolutely nothing because everything was on the pack pony that got completely devoured by the goblins. They also devoured all of the, the pack. The only thing that ended up being left were the metal buckles that the goblins couldn't eat. 
they move on, they fall in with a merchant caravan that is heading to Ondala Shirion, which is our next stop, and that is where we had gotten to so far. I'm going to get a drink, take a little break, walk around a little bit, and boy that took a long time to sum up 10 chapters, but we will do a much more in-depth review of chapter 10 into the mountains in just a minute. All right, hopefully the wind has died down a little bit and the Blue Jays are not too distracting as we do a more in-depth analysis and discussion of chapter 10 into the mountains where the boys having gotten a few supplies from the trading caravan that they spent the night with go over the mistrels this is a mountain range that back in the first trilogy took months to get through these days it's a fairly easy and well patrolled route they make it to ondala Shirion without any actual problems which is a good thing because they've had their fair share of issues on the road so far now once they get to Ondala Shirion, the first thing they need to do is head to the bank because they're pretty much out of money and now they need all new supplies. Tercel and Harrier get a modest room, stable their horses, and they head to the bank where Tercel lets Harrier know that he has no idea his father could have put an alert out saying if anyone comes to get this money, grab them immediately because it's my missing son. He doesn't know what's going to happen, so he tells Harrier to stay outside. He's going to go in, try to get some money, and in he goes. Well, in the bank, he not only gets his money, he discovers that his father is has written him a nice thick letter. Harrier's father has also written a letter to Harrier, and Tercel, after dealing with a rather officious bank clerk who lets him know that, young man, you are making considerable inroads on your monetary principle, he, he hands over the money, mostly in small bills, which aren't really bills, they're coins, and they reconvene outside, now with purses full of money and a couple of letters from home. Neither one of the boys is quite up to reading these letters from home just yet. Along the way, along the journey there, they had written more letters home letting their parents know that it wasn't going to be just a quick little one-month-long journey up to Centaur Shadin and back. They, they weren't sure when they were coming home, which is why Tercel was so nervous about going into the bank. Things seem to have at least mostly worked out. They go out. They, they've got money now. They were going to go to the library. That is where Harrier thought they were headed next. Instead, they do go and let the Forest Watch, which is Samara's employer, basically, let her know, or let the Forest Watch know that Samara was lost. Tercel lets the Forest Watch also know that he thinks that it was goblins that killed her because he's a student of ancient history and he's studying these things and they match the description of goblins. They don't tell the Forest Watch anything about the whole magic thing, but they, they let everything know. After that, they head back to their rooms, have a decent night, and the next day head to the library where Tercel discovers that Despite the fact that he thinks he's hot stuff because he was allowed into the closed sections of the library back in Armethale, that was actually only because he was friends with the head librarian and can't exactly head into the library here. Also, before they head to the library, both boys read their letters where they realize just how much their family loves them. Tercel's father gives Tercel a gentle scolding along with telling him that he trusts him, he loves him, and also that his sisters would like him to do some shopping because his sisters think he's still out just seeing the world. 
Harrier's dad writes to Harrier and basically just gives him a recitation of the day. But Harrier realizes that in spending all of the money that he had to spend to send a big, thick letter that's just full of nonsense, boring details, that's his father's way of telling him that he loves him, that he accepts his decision to head off with Tercel, and that there's always going to be room at the table for him. Both boys are very touched by these letters, and the next day when they go to the library, Tercel and Harrier try to get in. It doesn't really work. When leaving the library, they get into a little scuffle because something I didn't really talk about, which uh, is definitely very evident throughout this entire series, is that Harrier and Tercel bicker like brothers, but like brothers, they love each other dearly. So they get into a little scuffle. They're shoving each other. Tercel is calling Harrier, you know, uh, a stubborn mule. Harrier is calling Tercel a bookworm, and it escalates to a little bit of good-natured shoving and pushing and teasing, and Harrier, or no, Tercel actually ends up bumping into a very prosperous-looking man who's like, where are you going? Harrier's all ready to fight this guy. That's another defining characteristic of Harrier. He is a little short-tempered. Tercel, on the other hand, is always trying to make peace. So Tercel placates this man. Harrier tells him he was stupid for it, and they move on. Later on, after they spend a whole lot of money buying a whole lot of supplies, they're going to head to get something to eat because yet another defining characteristic of Harrier is the fact that he's definitely always hungry. I, I resonate very deeply with that after having all of the dental work done and living on nothing but soup and mashed potatoes for about a month. I resonate extremely deeply with Harrier always being hungry. So they're going to head, they're going to get something to eat, and they quickly discover that they have somehow managed to get lost in the seedier part of town. And then they start hearing the voice of the man that Tercel bumped into earlier in the day, telling them that he's going to get him. They bumble through the city, and every time they stop, they hear the man, they, they see torches flickering, they can hear feet running, and they're just chased around in circles until finally, in exasperation and cornered, Tercel summons a big old mage light. They turn to face their pursuer, and there's nobody there. Tercel is pretty sure that whoever was chasing them has something to do with the big red bear that also ended up getting chased away by mage light. Oh, and I forgot to tell you in my chapter summary that they also met another traveler along the way who for some reason could only see Tercel. So with three things being kind of coincidental, they're pretty sure that something is up. So finally, after they discover that whoever is chasing them is now gone, Tercel summons his mage light. They're able to actually read the map and make it back safely to their, uh, their hotel room. They are planning on staying for at least a fortnight in town. Harrier says that the horses need a good rest. They need a good rest. They still have to go through an even bigger mountain range as they head towards the elves. So that is their plans. Tercel's not really on board with this plan. He wants to get to the elves as quickly as he possibly can. And that's where we leave them, kind of not in 100% agreement about when they should be leaving, but heading to bed nonetheless. We then switch perspectives, and we are back with Bisochim. Bisochim, after sending a killing frost after his enemy, 
which he doesn't know who his enemy is. He just knows that it's his enemy. He goes down and does his scrying spell yet again and sees that the future that he foresaw has not changed. And that's, that's not cool. So he has decided what he actually needs to do because the voices in the fire are now telling him that um, he, he probably needs to protect his, his people, the Isvani. So he knows that he can't protect his people by telling them about how he wants them to stay safe. His people are a very hard people. The desert has no place for charity. And so he goes, he, he decides that he's going to talk to them and get them to unite and follow him by telling them that he needs them to be ready to march in war. So that is where we leave Bisochim. He's going to go and tell the Isvani that he needs them to be ready for war. We then shift to another new character. Her name is Sharia. Sharia is one of the, I'm going to have to look up the word. It's like Omari, Omar, Omaru. Yeah, the leader of her tribe. Her tribe is the Nelzinder Izvai and it is the smallest and quietest tribe of the Isvani. Now, the Nelzinder are entirely hunters. They keep no sh sheep. They do nothing but hunt. And we, we get to know a lot about her tribe, the fact that they are master hunters. And Sharia is not only a master hunter, she is a master's master hunter. It is said that the Isvai people, Isvani, can track with the best of them. Then the Nalzinder tribe are known to be able to track on the wind. And Sharia is said to be able to track the memory of tracks on the wind. So she's, she is the leader of her tribe and it is a well-earned leadership. We, we meet her as she is taking her shotar, which is, I'm guessing, a camel. The description makes it sound a lot like a camel. She is taking her shotar to trade a entire year's worth of furs because the Nalzinder don't actually do any weaving or spinning of their own. They trade furs for what they need. This is her big trading trip. We also learn that I think there are 13 tribes of Isvani and once a year there is a meeting of the tribes. There's a lot of inter-tribe war periodically, but in general the tribes only meet up once a year and Sharia is heading to one of the many oases to trade these furs. It's not time for the meeting of the tribes yet. And as she approaches the oasis, hoping that someone is there to trade with, she starts seeing lush grass. Now, lush grass in the desert is actually what we would probably consider um, like the grass behind me. <laughs> but lush grass for the desert indeed, and that's not right. She can also feel moisture in the air and taste a little bit of moisture on the tongue. She definitely, her wind is up. She knows that something is wrong. The closer she gets to the oasis, the more people she sees, which also is not right. She finally makes it into the oasis and she's very disturbed at this point. She changes a few folds of her desert robe so that no one can tell what tribe she belongs to and no one will be able to recognize her does a very perfunctory trade for the furs that she carries and then kind of does a little recon because she can tell something's not right. People aren't really talking to each other and when they do they're all talking about war. 
War is not something that has been seen in over a thousand years, and Sharia needs to know what is going on. It doesn't seem right. She makes it to the center of the oasis where there's not just a wellhead, which is all most oases in the desert are, it's an actual lake. She's never even seen a lake before. She's only heard about them, but there is now a lake here and sitting by the lake with all of the other tribal leaders, she sees Bisochim. She knows who Bisochim is because she's seen him a couple times before when he stopped and helped her tribe back when he wasn't bonded to a dragon. Not that she knows about the dragon yet. But the closer she gets, the more kind of scared she is because she can hear him saying, that the great armies of the north are coming and they want to scour the desert of all of the Isvani people. Bisochim tells everybody that since the time of the great flowering, light has overshadowed darkness and balance is out of true. This is words from the wild magic because he's claiming to be speaking for the wild magic at this point, and that all of the tribes must unite together. They must all treat each other as if they were from the same tent and unite and get ready because he needs them to be an army to scour the armies of the great north, and they're going to fight for the wild magic and balance, and Sharia's like, because he's not focusing his will and his magic on her directly, she's able to see that this is just a great big load of horse pucky. She knows that there is darkness in the world still. You know, there is sickness, there is death, there are still bad people who do bad things and there's also love and light and happiness. There is balance. Her tribe amongst all of the tribes is known for keeping the balance of the desert. You know, that's, that's kind of what they do. And so Sharia realizes that no, he's full of absolute dookie. And before he can notice her and know her as the leader of her tribe and maybe focus his will on her and bring her under his spell, she turns, grabs her shotar, and books it. She goes back to her people. When her people come to greet her, she's like, strike the tents, we're out of here, because our greatest mage, Bisochim, has been shadow-touched. And that's where we leave her. At the end of the chapter, we have yet one more perspective shift, and that is back to Harrier, who is sleeping and dreaming. Now, up until now, only Tercel has had any sort of strange dreams, but Harrier's having a strange dream. And Harrier's a little bit irritated because it's one of those lucid dreams. He knows he's dreaming. You know, it's one of those dreams where he's like, oh, I'm not actually awake. He knows in his dream that Tercel is with him, and he knows that he's in a cave. Why does he know he's in a cave? Because at one point when, Her when Tercel was about 12 years old, he went for about three months thinking about nothing but caves, and of course, because he and Tercel and Harrier are best friends, Tercel told Harrier everything that he was learning about caves. So Harrier's pretty sure he's in a cave. And he's a little bit cranky that the very first dream he has ever had that is a lucid dream is so boring. In the dream, he is completely aware that he's in a, in a dream, in a cave. Tercel is somewhere, although he can't see him. And he's also aware that someone is calling him. And that is where the chapter fades to black. So, 
pretty cool. Let's get up and walk a little bit because my rear end is getting tired and I'm using this dumb selfie stick. So we'll go down and we will look at the water and I will talk a little bit about this book because honestly, I do enjoy this book. It is a bit of a slow burn. I mean, granted it took me almost 40 minutes to get caught up to chapter 10, but there's a lot that happens. Now, Tercel and Harrier, as Hazel pointed out, kind of remind me of, well, a buddy cop, which is, I think, um, I think that was Hazel's contribution, was that they were a bit like a buddy cop. To me, they, they remind me of a pair of half-grown puppies who are always bickering and playing around and everything, but also are willing to go to bat for each other, as it should be. Now, a couple things about the world that I don't think I talked about when we were reading the Obsidian Trilogy. And I still don't really have straight in my mind is kind of the time system in this world. I mean, I think a lot of it comes from Old English. So, like, in America, we usually don't talk about a fortnight. But I think a fortnight is, like, two weeks I'm kind of assuming that a Sen night is probably a week. And then there are two different time conventions that I will probably be talking about as we go forward. Most of the world in this series tells time kind of the way we do, in hours. But in Armethele, the city, which I have been calling Arameth for three books, because I just now figured out how to say it the other way. But most of the world tells time in hours. In Armethele, they still tell time the old way, which is in bells. As near as I can figure, a bell is about two hours. And I think a chime is approximately 15 minutes, but it might be 30. Kind of an interesting mix. Also, like I said, the Dragon Bond is really interesting. Like, if you've ever read the series, let me know what you think of the whole Dragon Bond thing. But it definitely sounds like a jip for the dragons. I mean, they trade immortality basically for the ability to breed. And as it is said by many of, a dra many of the dragons, why does a species that's immortal actually need to breed? They don't really. It's kind of like in this series, the elves, because they're so long-lived, don't have children very often, which makes sense to me. I mean, if you're going to be living a thousand years, you don't really need to be having like eight kids. So it's interesting. Anyway, I have no idea if this was decent or not. I hope that I was able to at least convey this chapter in a decent way. Let me know gently. <laughs> I'm a feeling a little sensitive lately. Let me know what things you would like me to improve on. I could probably read some of the quotes from the books. I'll probably have to go through each chapter and kind of pick out the best ones. But yeah, let me know about what you thought. And if you kind of at least semi-like this chapter review style. And yeah, I, I hope you didn't hate it at least. And 
I will see you guys next time.